Good morning, church. Welcome to Louisville United Methodist Church. My name is Kara Chamberlain. I'm the associate pastor here, and I'm so glad to welcome you to our service of worship today. Before we get started, I have a few important announcements that I'd like to share with you. And I'd also like to encourage you to take a look at your bulletin. Your bulletin is, in, is full of important information about things that are going on in the life of our church. And it also has an opportunity for a minute. The opportunity form is your place where you can sign up for different things that are going on in the life of our church. And also, if it's your first time here, there's a place where you can put your name and your contact information so that we can follow up with you and get to learn more about you. You can place those opportunity forms in the tithes and offerings box, which is located at the back of the sanctuary on your way out. A few announcements that I'd like to share is that registration is open for Vacation Bible School. This will be during the summer on Wednesday nights for our three-year-olds through our fifth graders. And if you'd be interested in volunteering, you can check out the opportunity form for more information on how to do that as well. A few things that are coming up soon. Um, on Saturday, April the 27th, the Methodist men are going to have breakfast at 8 a.m. in the fellowship hall. And next Sunday, we're going to have an opportunity to eat together as a church family. We're going to have one of our monthly fellowship meals in the fellowship hall next Sunday at 5.30 p.m. The menu is pasta, salad, and garlic bread, and donations to cover the cost of the meal are appreciated. You can make a reservation for the, to attend the meal in the opportunity form. I also want to remind you that today, right after this service, we're having our lunch and learn about the general conference. This is an opportunity for you to come and learn more about how the United Methodist Church is structured and how we make choices, and you're welcome to join us in Asbury right after the service. I think that's enough announcements for me. Again, I encourage you to look at your bulletin and learn more about everything that's going on in the life of our church. Let's take a moment and take a big deep breath and breathe out anything that might distract us from being fully present with God, with ourselves, and with one another for the next hour or so. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning.
Please stand as you are able and join me for the call to worship. The words are printed in your bulletin and also on the screen. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers. What are human beings that you care for them?
please remain standing and join me for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated, and I'll invite all of the children to come on up for a special message just for them. Hey, friends. How's everybody doing today? Doing good? Yeah? Okay, friends. Well, I have a game for us to play today, okay? So we're going to split up into two teams. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and I make ten. Okay, so us five, we're going to be a team, okay? And you five, you are going to be a team. And here's how the game works. I have in my hand some paper clips. And the object of the game is to hold up your paper clip for a whole 30 seconds, okay? So if, if you hold it the whole time, you end the game with 10 points. Now, if you drop your paper clip, every time you drop your paper clip, you lose a point. And if you, whichever team has the most points at the end of the game, wins, right? Okay, so I'm gonna be the paper clip holder for our team. Evan Claire, will you be the paper clip holder for your team? And all you have to do is hold it out like this, okay? So I, can, I see my countdown up there, and we're gonna go for 30 seconds. Okay, on your mark, get set, go. Uh-oh, oops. Sorry, guys. I won't do it again. I won't do it again. Okay. Uh oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I promise I will not. I will not drop that paper clip again. I'm focusing. I'm focusing. Devin. I'm focusing. Oh darn. One more. Okay. Hold on. I got it. I got it this time, Bradley. I promise. I got it. Okay. Ready? Got it. Five more seconds. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Oh. Oh no. Oh no. Okay, that was 30 seconds. Evan, Claire, did you drop your paper clip at all? Yeah. Okay, so you have 10 points. How many times did I drop my paper clip? Like five times? No, four. Four? Four, five? <laughs> Jury's out on that one. Maybe it was six? Okay. So I guess I didn't do such a great job, did I? No, I dropped the paper clip. But you didn't drop the paper clip, so you guys, you guys won the game. So friends, may, we could, if you want to play again, um, do you guys want to be on my team again? Yeah, I'll be on Well, I'm going to be the holder. <laughs> I'm going to be the holder. Do you want to be on my team, or do you want to maybe switch and have Amanda and Claire be your holder? <laughs> Mila says switch. You, you want to switch to Evan and Claire? That's only fair. That was kind of frustrating, right? Thank you so much for playing the game. I'll take that back. Appreciate you. So that was just a silly game, but it actually shows us something about God. You guys were kind of frustrated when I kept dropping that paper clip, right? Did it even maybe seem like I was doing it on purpose? Yeah, yeah I should have been able to hold up that paper clip, right? But I couldn't. I kept making the same mistakes over and over again. So when it came time to play again, you all said, maybe we don't want to be on her team anymore. And you know what? 
That's probably fair. But friends, I have some really good news. You know who is not like that? You know who does not say, I don't want to be on their team anymore? God. God. That's right. See, friends, today we are going to hear a story from God's Bible about how God forgives us no matter how many times we drop our paper clip. It's fair that you got frustrated that over and over and over again, I kept making the same mistakes. That's part of being human. We get frustrated about that. But the good news is that God does not. Every time we make a mistake, or we choose not to listen, or we do something bad, or we hurt someone else, you know what happens? God forgives us. Even if we don't deserve to be forgiven, God forgives us over and over and over again. Because God loves us so much. God doesn't look at us and say, oh, that's Kara, who keeps making the same mistake over and over again. No, he says, that's Kara, my beloved child. And that is some really good news, friends. Now, that doesn't mean we should go out and break all the rules and hurt people and do things that we know are wrong just because we're going to be forgiven. No. We should always do our best to make the right choices. But when we find ourselves in a situation where we've made a mistake, maybe we've let someone down or we've hurt someone or we've not been a good listener, we can trust that God always forgives us and God is always on our team no matter what. And that is good news. So friends, let's say a prayer and then we'll go back and sit in our seats, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us no matter how many times we drop the paper clip. Thank you for always forgiving us and for always being there for us. Help us to know how much we are loved and cared for by you. And keep us all safe and happy and healthy until we can be together again. And all God's friends said, Amen. Okay, good listeners, you can go back and sit in your seat. All right, and now we turn as a family of faith to our joys and our concerns. It's good to be here in God's house together on this third Sunday of Easter as we continue our celebration of the resurrection. We are Easter people, and so we want to lift up some of our friends who are hurting in their bodies, minds, and spirits, knowing that God has promised to be with them and, and to offer us that peace that no one can ever take us away. So um, I want to say a prayer this morning for um, Chris Sana Frank. His mom, Sandy, we've been praying for, passed away on Wednesday. She had deep faith in the Lord, and so there's comfort for the family in that. But if you'll pray for, for Chris as they grieve the loss of his mother, Sandy. Um, we're celebrating with Betty and Steve who are here today, the Schwartzes. They have a brand new granddaughter named Allie, so we celebrate with you guys. And also we continue to pray for Betty's sister, Peggy, um, as she has cancer and is kind of figuring out next steps for treatment. Um, many of you know we uh, were anticipating having Jackie Harrell's Celebration of Life funeral service here later in the month. Um, that service has been postponed um, because uh, Jackie's daughter, Ashley, is in the hospital. There's some kind of a mass that she has on her brain. And so they're trying to determine treatment. And so until they can figure all that out, uh, we have postponed Jackie's funeral. But we ask for prayers for Ashley. Um, continue praying for Irene Foster. Um, Irene, in addition to recovering from her fall and her broken wrists that she had surgery on this week, uh, uh, found out she has shingles and pneumonia. And so if you know Irene, she is a very tough lady. She's back home. Um, but she's hurting, so if you'll pray for her, I know she would appreciate it, and Suzanne as well, as she cares for her. Maxine Mast, another one of our beloved church members, Maxine fell last week and broke her hip, and so she had surgery, and she's in Salem Town recovering from that surgery now. I'm sure she'd love a visit if you're able to swing by sometime this week. Continue to pray for Wayne Horsley, uh, Sandy Barrett's friend, Gerald in the hospital, her niece Ramona who's having heart problems, uh, Karen Friday, who's recovering from surgery, doing a little bit better each week, and Watkins' brother, John, who is just doing phenomenally um, from where he was, and just almost a miracle uh, as far as his recovery so far, so continue to pray for John, and then Paul and Cornelia's grandson, Asher, um, this little boy who is really, really having a hard time in the hospital, and so if you'll pray for him as well. So that's a lot. 
but it's been a couple weeks since I've been with you. Wanted to make sure to bring you up to speed on all of our people. Um, are there other joys or concerns that you have to add this morning? Yes, Rita. David and Ronnie, two friends who have cancer. Yes, Stephanie. Who is my sister's mother-in-law, but also was the person that took care of me when I was in college when my parents were overseas, and is like a grandparent to my children, had a stroke, and is in rehab now. She's in Winston-Salem, um, and she's in rehab now, so just to pray for her and my sister and her husband in dealing with all that. Okay. David and Ronnie with cancer, and Doris yes. recovering from a stroke. Yes. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, Dirk. their name? All right, let's pray for Tanya. Others? Okay. Let's go to God in prayer and conclude together with the Lord's Prayer. O oh God, our Father, you have told us, your children, that we can come to you with all of our needs and that you are always listening. You are waiting for us to bring our hearts and our requests to you. And so we lift up to you the things that are, are burdening us this morning, that are weighing us down. And, and a big part of that, Father, is the people that we know and love who are hurting. Uh, we have listed some of their names to you today. Ashley, Chris and his family, Peggy, Irene, Maxine, Wayne, Gerald, Ramona, Karen, John, Asher, David, Ronnie, Doris, and Tanya, and many, many others that we love, God, that we haven't spoken out loud. We lift each one silently up to you. We bless that you would, uh, we ask that you would bless each one of these, our sisters and brothers the light of your healing love, and that you would use us in whatever ways we can to encourage them and to let them know how much they matter to us. Father, we also pray for a world that is filled with violence and war and rumors of more war. We think especially this morning of the situation in Israel with this attack from Iran and and so much conflict with all the many nations in that area. God, we pray for peace. We pray for protection of the innocent. And we pray, Lord, uh, that you would use your church in those nations to be peacemakers and to reach out to those who are hurting. We pray, Lord, also for our family here at Louisville United Methodist, that you would bind us together in not only mutual love for one another and for you, but, but in service to this community to try to make Louisville a better place and make it look a little bit more like your kingdom. As we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God is good. And all the time, God is our rock and refuge in all times. And so we can rely on God to give us the strength and the faith we need for each day. One way that we live out our faith is through our tithes and our offerings, our offering boxes in the back of the church, and we thank you for your generous spirits. Um, you may have seen in the newsletter our Lenten offering that went to support the preschool and the after school. I think we collected over $17,000. I think that deserves a round of applause, don't you? And that money will be spent.
split between our preschool and our after school. And so I'm just, I'm just so excited to be a part of this church family and, and appreciate the work that we are able to do together. Um, another way to give back is through these opportunity forms and your bulletins. And if you're visiting with us, we hope you'll take a moment to fill out the back, drop that in the offering box, and thank you for making our ministry possible.
God, you are the source of every good and perfect thing. And so we offer back to you the gifts we have received. We ask that you would take them, bless them, and multiply them to do the work that you have called us to do. Through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Join me in the prayer for illumination found printed in your bulletin and on the screen. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. The scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Verses 11 through 32, we all mostly know is the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. Soon after, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There, he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in that country, and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food but I'm starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. 
and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant replied, your brother has arrived and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in, but his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, look, I've served you all these years and I've never disobeyed your instruction. Yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned, after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Then his father said, son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's like a sign from God. Some of you may have heard those words spoken by none other than Al Roker live on CBS this week as the clouds parted at just the right moment, offering a beautiful, clear view of the total solar eclipse in Dallas. I know we had some friends who traveled there from our church and were in Dallas. They got to watch that in person and you could see the, the audience behind Al Roker plunged into the darkness and they burst out into cheers. It was a scene that replayed all across uh, North America from Mexico up to Maine. Millions of people stopping what they were doing to just stand and and gape up at the heavens, staring at this amazing event of the moon passing in front of the sun. Now, some of you got to watch that here in Louisville. I think we were around 85% or so um, uh, of an eclipse, but some also got to see it in the path of totality. And, and my family and I, we had the chance to do that back in 2017 when if you remember, the eclipse kind of came through North Carolina at that time. The path did. And we went down into Jackson County to a place called Bear Lake. And I'll never forget uh, that experience and how dark and cold the world became and how you could see all these little lights begin to flicker on around the lake. And if you listened, you could hear the confused sound of crickets <laughs> that were coming out like, oh, here we go. You know, I guess it's time for us to start chirping again. It was a, almost like a mystical kind of experience to be a part of. There's a, a journalist named Elizabeth Diaz. She writes about faith and spirituality. And I love what she had to say about the eclipse this week. She said it, it really was one of those rare glimpses of unity for us, if we had the eyes to see it, right? Like that the eclipse offered this chance for all of us, this reminder for all of us, everyone, at the same time and on the same day, that the world that we are a part of can be a magical place, right? That that being alive is a collective experience. It's something that we do together. And, and that there is an astonishment, there is an awesomeness uh, when you realize that you are just one small part of something that's so much bigger. You are part of this greater story. Uh, now, I, you probably got a glimpse of that yourself on your social media feed. I think the eclipse kind of took over everything on Monday. Uh, but it really was evoking something deeper within us, that basic human response of awe and wonder that all of us have. Something that was captured thousands of years ago right here in our Bible, in the psalmist who says, O Lord, our Lord. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, 
the moon and the stars which you have made, what are human beings that you care about us, that you are mindful of us, that you pay attention to us? You know what's interesting about this kind of shared spiritual moment that we were all a part of this past week is that it comes at the same time when religion is in steep decline, at least here in the United States, and where more and more people are spending time on their own, right? Perhaps with a, a screen, but physically on their own, struggling to make friends, longing for some kind of a deeper connection. You know, I have to wonder, uh, is that longing, uh, where does that come from that we have deep within us? And how do we make sense of our existence on this little terrestrial ball that's just hurtling around the sun? What could it mean for us to say together with Al Roker as we lift our eyes to the heavens, oh, wow, I believe in God. Last week, Pastor Kara kicked off this new sermon series for us called The Short List, where she just explored with you that basic idea of belief in general, right? That, that belief is more complicated than we sometimes make it out to be. It's a combination of thinking and feeling, of knowledge, but also experience. And we believe in all kinds of things, but when it comes to God, what do we believe about God? That can be a difficult question, right, to begin to answer not least of which because there are so many different religions. There are so many different churches out there. You probably passed multiple churches on your way to this church this morning. And each one, it feels like, has its own long list of beliefs that they want you to kind of sign up for. Here at our church, uh, we talk a lot about how we don't have to agree on every single little thing. Right, but how we try our best to love and respect each other, to work together to make a difference in our community. But still, you know, we talk about being a family, but we are a family of faith, right? And so that means that we are so much more than just another service club with a steeple on top. Right? We are united by these essential beliefs that make us who we are, that make us Christians, summed up in what we call the Apostles' Creed. Now, we have a tendency to recite these words on Sunday mornings in our traditional service, but we use them in both of our worship services at, at one particular event. I don't know if you can think of what it might be, but it's every time someone is baptized or when we renew our baptismal vows. That is what Pastor Kara was teaching us last week. That's how the Apostles' Creed started, as a statement of faith for people being baptized, being adopted into the family, right? That, that we, we dust off these words that began as a prayer on the lips of Jesus' very first followers. And so for us, the Creed is a reminder that you don't have to go make up your own religion, right? And figure out all these big questions about who is God. But instead, when we stand up together and we recite the creed, you are remembering that you are part of this family that includes billions of people in every country and in, and in all kinds of denominations stretching back thousands of years. All these people who have been telling the same story about a God who comes looking for us, I believe in God, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. There's a wonderful scene in the TV show Young Sheldon. I don't know if any of you have watched this show. It's kind of a spin-off prequel to the Big Bang Theory. Um, and in the show, uh, Sheldon, who's like a 10-year-old genius, He's sitting outside with his mother, Mary. They live in a small Texas town, and Mary is a devout Baptist. But she is struggling to believe in God because of a tragedy in their community. 
And so little Sheldon sits down next to her outside, and as they look up at the stars together, he asks her, did you know that if gravity was slightly more powerful, the entire universe would collapse into a single ball of energy? And, and if gravity was slightly less powerful, the universe would fly apart and there would be no stars, there would be no planets. And she kind of looks at him and says, okay, well, what's your point? And he says, the, the point is, is that gravity is precisely as strong as it needs to be in order for life to exist. He asks, what do you think the odds are that that might happen all by itself. And in response, his mom kind of says, well, my problem is not so much up here, you know, with logic and the head, it's, it's here. And Sheldon thinks for a moment longer and then responds by saying, well, there are five billion people on this planet and you are the perfect mom for me. What are the odds of that? And she says, okay, <laughs> he got her in the heart, right? Thank you, Lord, for giving me this little boy. To say, I believe in God, the maker of heaven and earth, is the ability to look around at the world and to say, I am not here by accident. That none of us are here by accident. That the world is too beautiful and complex to not have a creator. Now, in the church that I grew up in, it was very important that everyone believe that God created the world in six literal days. But what's interesting to me is that in the creed, it doesn't really box God in in terms of how the world was created. It simply states that God is the maker of all that there is, seen and unseen. And that a God who could hang the stars and who could find that perfect measurement of gravity for life to exist and who could time every single eclipse, that a God like that can only be described as the Almighty One, the one who can do anything above and beyond what we can imagine. But still, if all we can say about God is that God is the almighty creator, then what kind of relationship could we have with a God like that? We might be able to uh, have fear or reverence or awe when we think about a creator God, but could we have a personal relationship with God? Would it be possible to love a God like that? And so the creed take thing, takes things a step further for us, saying that the Almighty God is also our Father. I can remember when my kiddos were little, I thought I'd share this little, look at their chubby cheeks, man, I miss these days. Um, and they would do this thing when they were babies where they would reach out for my face and they'd pull me close and they would say that word that made me the happiest man in the world, dada, right? Later it became daddy. And I wonder, you know, if Joseph had that same feeling when little Jesus reached for his face and squealed, Abba. Right? That's the Aramaic word for daddy. It's a word that little Jewish children would have shouted with joy when their father walked through the door and that they would have cried out in fear when they were hurting or when they were scared, Abba, Daddy. And so when Jesus grows up, he calls God Abba, right? It's a, a word that is full of love and closeness and trust to his daddy's lap. Him, our Father in heaven. And then in the story that we heard Rick read for us today, Jesus tells us about a father who loved his sons 
more than anything in the world. But one of those sons, the baby, you know about the babies, the baby was determined to do things on his own, right, to figure out things by himself. He didn't need anybody else. Sound familiar to us today? And so what does this son do? Well, he breaks his daddy's heart. He leaves, goes off on his own. Until one day when he has no more money, he's spent his very last daughter, uh, dollar, not daughter, uh, he spent his very last dollar. All of his so-called friends, they are nowhere to be found, right? They are gone. They've deserted him. He wisens up and thinks, what am I doing? <laughs> I have made a, a terrible mistake. It's time to go back home. And so all the way back, he's reciting this apology in his head. He's practicing because he's worried. He's scared. What is dad going to do when I get back home? Is he um, going to take me back? What is he going to say? And if we were talking about most dads, then we could understand that maybe the father would lose his temper and kind of thunder, where have you been? What did you do with my money? How are you ever going to pay me back? But that is not the Abba that Jesus knows. And so instead in the story, what is the father doing? He's waiting. He's watching. He's longing for that son to return until suddenly he catches a glimpse of him coming over the hill and the father takes off running, running down that dirt road. And before the son can get the words out of his mouth, the father scoops him up, swings his little boy around, and, and showers him with hugs and kisses and tears of joy, saying, I missed you so much. I love you more than ever. Welcome home, my child. Let's, let's celebrate. Let's have a party. And Jesus says, that is who God is. If you want to know who God is, God is the one who is waiting for you to fall into his arms. There's this uh, video that I watched years ago from just down the road in, in Durham, North Carolina, at, at an elementary school where the third grade class was lining up for picture day. It was school picture day. And uh, one of the little boys in line, an eight-year-old um, named Joshua, Joshua Bass, he was waiting, and when his name was called, he went and stood in front of the background and smiled for the camera like all the rest of the kids, except he was the only kid who got photobombed by his dad on that day. His father, uh, Colonel James Bass, had been deployed in Kuwait overseas for a year, and gave his son the surprise of his life when that photographer turned the camera around and little Joshua saw in the picture his dad standing in the background. And that little boy leapt into his daddy's arms and cried out, Daddy, you're home before laughing and saying, you still got it, Dad. <laughs> you still got it. Now, sisters and brothers, what I want you to know this morning is that you do not have to have the burden of making up your own religion or of trying to figure things out on your own. Instead, when we stand together as a community and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, we're saying that we put our trust in the God who comes looking for all of us. So what about you? I don't know what kind of dad you may have had in this life. Many of you had wonderful fathers. Um, but what would it look like for you to allow yourself to be held in the arms of your heavenly father here today? And to be a part of this family that we call Louisville United Methodist, where we are all brothers and sisters. Children of the same father. Because you see, the truth is, the truth of the creed and the hope of Christianity that has been passed down through the centuries to all of us today is that the almighty God, 
the maker of heaven and earth, is the one who comes running to us, scoops us in his arms, swings us around, and between laughter and tears of joy, says, welcome home. You can call me dad. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that even when we go astray and figure we can do things on our own, you are always waiting and watching with open arms and a heart overflowing with love. We can't say thank you enough for being that kind of Abba. And we pray that you would fill us with love for our brothers and our sisters, that we might be your family here on earth today. We pray in our brother Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand and sing with me? I once was lost and now I'm found. Now, children of God, brothers and sisters, go from this place with the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. Amen.